depending on the program that you are applying for and your stage, there are different things that people generally look for, and people have different priorities. But in my mind, there are at least three different areas of things that we look for in conducting videos. The first part is your knowledge of the score. The second part is your conducting techniques, and the third is your connection with musicians, your interaction with them, and your personality. Hey there! Welcome to the Conductors Podcast. I'm your host Chao Wenting, a conductor with over 20 years of experience working with professional symphony orchestras, opera houses, new music groups, and vocalists. I'm also founder of Girls Who Conduct, and have mentored hundreds of conductors from across the globe. I created the Conductors Podcast to share all the behind-the-scenes secrets with you, while I interview conductors, musicians, and business gurus from around the world. This is a space created for conductors, conducting students, musicians. And non-musicians who are curious and interested in learning more about the profession, craft, industry, and business. Shy away from the real talk? <laughs> no way. Money, hardship, growth, and the roller coaster of a conducting career are all topics we discuss here. I will give you simple, actionable, step-by-step -step strategies to help you take action on your big dream. Move through the fear that's holding you back, and have a real impact. Now, pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. Hello, hello, hi there! Welcome to episode number thirty of the Conductors Podcast. Oh my god, I can't really wrap my head around the idea that we are now at. Episode thirty three zero of the podcast. Thank you so much for listening along the way, and for those who DM me or send me an email to share with me your ideas, your feedback. I thank you so much for your support and for your encouragement. For those of you who didn't reach out but are listening, I love you dearly as well. I'm your host Chao Wenting, and today's episode is a little different, as I will be answering all the questions that I received about conducting videos. In the time that we live right now, it can be denied that conducting video has become such an important thing about related to our career. Really, honestly, when I started out as a student, it wasn't. This case,、um, for a lot of the school programs that you just went in and auditioned, sometimes you pass round like days and days of different rounds of different tests to get to the last stage of actually conducting a group in front of the juries. But nowadays, sending a pre-screening conducting video has become the standard for almost everything. From graduate schools to workshops to fellowship programs, master classes, and to jobs, so it's so important that we understand how people are viewing those videos. And if you didn't know, I wanted to remind you that the very, very first episode of this podcast was about conducting videos. I talked about the five mistakes to avoid in your conducting videos in that episode number one, and I'll put that in a show note. But you can find everything available at chowenting. dot com forward slash one, just the number one. The five mistakes in episode one were quite basic, but. If you know me a little bit, you know that I love starting with the basics because, as you can imagine, a lot of people don't even pay attention to details and basics. And as you all know, this field is so selective 
and so competitive. Sometimes you miss out an opportunity just because of one of those little details that you missed. So I would love to remind you again and again: check and check, double check and double check, and find multiple eyes to look at your materials before you send it out. As always, if you can, if time allows. So today I'm going to answer quite a few questions that I got from students, from mentees, and from people who reached out to me, and I wanted to be very, very clear upfront that people have different preferences. People look at those videos differently, but there are a few things that are still quite general, and everyone. Can be reminded. Then that's what I am going to focus right now. Before we start it, though, I still want to remind you that you always, always, always want to send a footage that is placed that the camera is placed at the back of the ensemble, meaning that we are seeing the front part of the conductor. We want to see your face, your gesture, your hands, your eye contact, and if you're not wearing mask, your facial expressions. When you have a video that is probably provided to you by the organization or by the theater for their commercial or archival usage, that has multiple cameras. That sometimes you're at the back, sometimes it's the front of you. You want to make sure that. You cut it, so it shows the first second when we see the video. It has your face. Sometimes people don't have the patience or the time to look through the video with the multi camera to find what they want to see about you, and you don't want to miss out an opportunity just because of that. So this is one of the common questions that I got. To, I got asked a lot. So people will ask me, "Hey, I have a much better sound quality or a much better performance, but the video is not showing my back, like not showing my front. Should I submit it in place of the one that I have with my face, but either the sound quality is not good or the performance was bad?" I would always say, you have to look at it from a view of. Sending a package. Most of the time, you are asked to submit at least two contrasting videos, and you want to kind of evaluate where you are in terms of your materials. So, say if this one you are debating is not of the best quality in terms of the sound or in terms of the performance, but you your conduction was so good. That you are very expressive, and you have another conducting video that shows you with a more dry and cut repertoire. Say maybe like a piece that shifts the meter a lot, so you show your techniques, and this would be a good complement to to send a good package. Then I would say use it, but don't don't just send. A better quality one only because that one has better audio quality. You want to make sure that your conducting is also good enough, or your conducting in that better quality footage has some unique things about you other than the other footage that you have. So you are representing yourself well. Question number two was. Does the repertoire matter? And if so, what should I put out there? For this question, and also for a lot of the questions that I'm going to discuss today, the context is very important. So it really depends on what kind of things that you are applying for. If you are just starting out and you are applying for a graduate program, say a master's degree or a doctoral degree, or sometimes even if you are applying for a master class, a summer festival, it might not matter that much because we understand if you are just starting out, you probably have limited footage. 
Also, when you finally get a chance to conduct the ensemble, you probably don't have many choices in terms of repertoire, right? You are either assigned a piece by your teacher, or it's whatever this ensemble can play. Or if you are putting together、um, an ensemble just to record the footage, you have to find something that your players can successfully perform. So we understand that if you are at the earlier stage of your career, that it's whatever repertoire that you have available. But if you are going to a more advanced level, you are at a later stage of your training or career. I would really encourage you to think more carefully about the repertoire that you put out there. On one side, you want to have at least some standard repertoire that people know. You don't want to send materials of only premieres of your composer friends' works,、um, because it's hard for people to judge if the conducting was good without knowing the music, right? So you want to at least have some very standard ones, and. Now I've learned it the hard way. I would avoid putting out repertoire that is a little controversial. You know, some pieces are very unique that people have strong opinions on how the piece should be done, and those opinions can be very personal and very different from person to person. So I won't. Put something out there, and then giving people a chance to not like my conducting because of my musical choices. I learned this the hard way because I had a footage that I, I'm so proud of, and I thought it's one of my best conducting ever. And I've been sending this out for competitions, for master classes, for jobs for quite a while until. One day I got a feedback, which is rare. You don't always get feedback about your materials, but I got feedback from a fellowship program that I applied for that I didn't get, and they commented on the musical choices about that particular piece. They were like, "This is not the right tempo for this particular one, and this piece should be." More sarcastic, while your take was too standard or like too polite and other things like that, and it got me thinking. Oh, so people do have very strong opinions about this piece, and while this is my best conducting, I am putting myself in a, a somehow awkward or weaker position for criticism. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that criticisms are bad. It's what got us improve and make us better. But when people don't agree with your musical choices or your interpretation, sometimes it's very hard for them to look beyond those bias or disagreement and see values in your conducting or in your thinking process in your artistic visions. So I learned it the hard way. I stop putting this out there, and I start like doing some other, more kind of safer choices. And I talk to a few colleagues, and they all agree with me. So this is something that I learned recently, that I would put some、um, repertoire that the orchestra sounds good, and that shows my musicality and. The way I move the musicians, rather than something that is so specific that people would disagree with my choices in conducting. So this is my answer about the repertoire. And another thing that I wanted to po- point out is, if you are getting a few friends together to record a session for you, you want to make sure that you find a good repertoire. That the musicians will sound good. You know, there are pieces that sound harder than it actually is, and there are some other ones the other way around. You know,、um, you want to make sure if because you, when you're putting a reading session, you obviously don't have a lot of time to rehearse. 
So you want something that is sight readable and is effective, that has something that is challenging for conductors, such as tempo change, transition. You know, like showcasing your your strength. So think about that. And the other way of finding good repertoire is to look at other conductors' repertoire choices. So I will Google people's website. You know, people kind of around you, around where you are in in your career, and look at your website and see what pieces they have out there on their website to get an idea what are the good pieces as a demo showing your conducting ability. Next is about rehearsal footage. So people get asked to. Provide a rehearsal footage, and I generally try to avoid those, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But if you are really sending out rehearsal footage, be very, very, very careful of the materials that you are sending out. First of all, you want to make sure that you are speaking. If you do speak. Is loud enough, and it's audible, and it's understandable. Sometimes, depending on where you place the mic microphone or the camera, you might not sound loud enough or clear enough in your footage, and that's a disaster to present to whoever that is watching your footage. You want to make sure that everything you say. Can be clearly understood in your footage if you're sending out any rehearsal footage. Add captions if needed, but captions should only be, you know, a supplement instead of in place of the words that we should be hearing. Another thing is you want to make sure that the Rehearsal is good, is effective, so it's useful to give a little context. Well, people don't always read them, I promise you, but for those who read them, it's nice to give a little context of what kind of rehearsal this is. So you would, I would encourage you to put in as the title card within the video, saying this is the first round through, or this is the. Final dress rehearsal, or kind of where you are in the rehearsal stage, to understand better what group, what kind of group this is. And I would really encourage you to check out episode nineteen, where I talk about how to run effective and efficient rehearsal by using your voice well. You don't want to send a rehearsal footage with all the mistakes that I mentioned in that episode, such as if you talk over musicians still playing. You know, once you finish or once you stop conducting, there is always going to be a musician or two that played a lot longer than everyone else, and you don't want to be talking over someone else still playing. You want to make sure that your voice is loud enough and it's clear, as we said just a minute ago. And you want to be addressing very basic things before you talk about style and phrasing and all other things. What does that mean? If there are still wrong notes, wrong rhythm in the piece that you haven't corrected yet, then just go ahead and talking about. The phrasing and the style. This is more romantic than the other. Is a really bad idea. The next question that people really want to know the answer is, what do people look for? Again, depending on the program that you are applying for and your stage, there are different things. That people generally look for, and people have different priorities. But in my mind, there are at least three different areas of things that we look for in conducting videos. The first part is your knowledge of the score. 
The second part is your conducting techniques, and the third is your connection with musicians, your interaction with them, and your personality. And depending on what you're applying for, these areas would weigh differently. For example, if you are just applying for a graduate program or a master's class, master class, or even a summer festival, the teacher might be looking for someone with good personality who can connect with musicians, other than good conducting techniques, because that's probably something that they can teach you or they can help you with. But If you are applying for a job already, then people do expect that you have certain conducting techniques that you can get through rehearsal or performances without having difficulty because of your own lack or bad techniques, if that makes sense. So that's diving a little more into these three areas. First is knowledge of the score, and that. Also includes your musicality, your musical、um, ideas, and if you're a good musician or not. Some people will ask, "Okay, how do you know if I don't know the score?" Well, let me ask you: Can you tell if people talking to you don't know what they're talking about? I think it's pretty obvious, right? We can really tell. We know. Everybody knows, and if you don't know and you are faking, you know some people would have their eyes rolling, or some, one obvious thing is some people would look down to the score a lot when they should be really connecting with the musicians or directing the mu- music. Um, you know, you know it. Or if they miss the entrances, um, they acknowledge something. After it happens, instead of bringing in a musical element beforehand, we know these things. It's very, very obvious. The second part is certain conducting techniques. As and as I said, um, if you are applying f- for an educational setting, this is something that. Perhaps some teachers don't care about that much if they are going to teach you their techniques.、Um, I spoke with quite a few teachers heading a graduate program. They always tell me that they are looking for a good musician and someone that they w- would love to work with and feel that they can help. So, for an educational setting, they are not always looking for the best conductor. I remember I got this wrong like twenty years ago when I was applying for programs. I would think, "Oh, really? That person got into that program? He was really bad, or she can't even conduct. She can't even keep the tempo." Well, I forgot the factor that the teacher. It's not about who was the best candidate, but About who the teacher wants to work with as a student, so they are for sure looking for someone that they can help or be a good as as um a, be a good team member for their program. But as I said, if you are applying for something that of a higher level, say a job or a fellowship with a professional organization. They want to make sure that you have at least decent enough techniques that you are not suffering, that your musical ideas are not suffering because you can't communicate well with the musicians. So having a certain techniques are is important. And as Alice Farham said in the previous episode, conducting techniques. Is not something that is separated from the music. It's something that you use as tools to serve your musical ideas. But it is something that you can improve from. There is nothing wrong about 
learning the distribution of your beat. You know, just like string players learn bow disciplines, they learn how to distribute the bow. So if they speed up and put in more weight, it produces different sound. And conducting is like that. When you move your hand, or if when you move your baton at different speed with different weight or resistance, for different travel, when you travel through different distance, it provoke different sound. And you want to make sure that everything you do physically is for the purpose of serving the music making. So that's all I'm going to say about techniques because there are different schools, and we can all wait. We can all of us can continue working on having better technique, knowing the music better, um, being a better musician, and all that. And the last part is about how you connect with the musicians, and we can tell. If you are really connected with the musicians, if they are willing to play for you, if they are reacting to your gesture and your conducting and your leadership, and we sometimes see a little bit of personality as well. You know what? For example, once I saw a friend's conducting video that she posted on social media, and my first impression was. Oh gosh, she was. She seemed so insecure in that footage, and why was that? She looked down at the last beat of every single bar. She knew the score really, and she was really connecting with the musicians at times. But that flow really got disrupted and interrupted because she looked down literally. Every single bar, and there was really, really no use of that. While it only showed that she was still very insecure about what she was doing. So that's what I meant that we see your personality a little bit,、um, sometimes a whole lot. <laughs> you know, there are people conducting with great gestures, camera posing faces. While it has very little to do with the music, but it looked great. That's another type of conducting as well. So, depending on who is evaluating the videos and what you're applying for, I think these three areas: one, your knowledge of the score or your musicality; two, your conducting techniques; and three, how you connect with the musicians and your personality. Would weigh differently in our evaluation. Lastly, before we wrap up, I want to remind everyone to please、uh, double check, triple check your spelling of the composer and the piece. You can't imagine how many typos or errors that we see in those spellings, and it's just. It just set a really, really bad impression about you. And another thing is, put your best work first. People don't watch a whole lot of the videos, to be honest. Sometimes people only watch twenty seconds or forty seconds, less than a minute or so. So you want to make sure that the very beginning of your conducting video is interesting enough to. Attract people wanting to see more about you. You should and can cut and edit as long as you're not changing the tempo, you know, or、um, changing the sound of the ensemble. But you certainly can and should start somewhere in the middle, in the end. It doesn't have to make musical sense. It can be in the middle of a phrase, in the middle of a section. But show your best first. And I wanted to encourage everyone to please check the very first episode of the podcast about the basic rules about conducting videos, and also episode number eight nineteen about running effective and efficient rehearsals by using your voice well. And 
make sure that if you are submitting a rehearsal footage, you are not exposing yourself to bad mistakes. All right, here we go, and I will see you next week again with an interview with a dear friend.、Um, If you have any ideas of what you want to hear in the solo episode, or if you want to know any tips about conducting,、um, about the career, about the, the industry, please feel free to reach out to me. I can be found at the Conductors Podcast, one word at gmail dot com, or you can find me on social media, send me a DM or so. And thank you again for tuning in with me today. I will see you next week at the same time, same place. Bye for now.